So what is Greatest? All right, so, um, so I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Greatest. Uh, Greatest is a next-gen media company, which is a fancy way of saying we're an online publisher today. We produce content on fitness, health, and wellness. So it means healthy recipes, workouts, sort of journey stories of people who've improved. We do it in a way that's science-backed, expert-approved, but the way we talk about health is authentic and real. Uh, I grew up struggling with my weight and felt like there wasn't a brand that really spoke sort of our language, my language, um, that didn't make me feel worse about myself, but actually made me feel better and felt like millennials were shifting in the way they thought about health and wanted to, you know, felt angry and frustrated that there wasn't and became obsessed with what if somebody could build a brand that really resonated with, you know, this demographic um, that actually pushed them to improve, celebrated when they did, as opposed to make them feel like they would never, you know, get to somewhere, get to that six-pack abs in six weeks. Which you did at one point. It's true. It's a true story. That's, I feel like that's a fun fact. That is a fun fact. Finally. We're looking uh, for a picture of Derek's abs, but... If you want to read some really depressing shit, I highly recommend my series on how to get six-pack abs in six weeks. Uh, I wrote all about how terrible that experience was and how, for me at least, they didn't lead to me feeling happier, but frankly, I... I don't think I ever felt worse in my life than what I did when I looked at what like is pretty superficially recognized as or thought of as like physical peak success. Uh, I felt you know mentally the worst that I ever have, and uh, great. It's probably a really extreme example of the greatest my company is all about. Uh, we write about content in a way that doesn't make you feel like this is something you will never be able to achieve, or that that's what you need to be happy. But actually, that you don't need them to be happy. Happiness is just finding something that's good for you and you know, helping you find the things that you love that are good for you because then you'll actually keep doing them because I've got this crazy notion that that's how you actually adopt sustainable long-term habits. So do you feel like the, there's a lot out there on the topic of health and wellness? And, and do you feel that the almost limitless information about diets and exercise, it's helping people lead healthier lifestyles or that it's almost information overload and there's, I don't know what to do, there's so much out there, what is the right thing for me? Well, I think everyone would agree there's a lot of information out there on health and wellness. I think that's probably something most people would agree with. I do think most people would also say that it's confusing and, I, you know, coffee's good for me one day, coffee's bad for me the next day. And I think a, a large part of that is because traditional media uses health and fitness as like a lifestyle category. And so it's like a Kim Kardashian story. Kim Kardashian's in this store and then she's wearing this thing. And health and fitness is sort of treated like that. And I think it's a big reason why people stop trusting traditional media when it comes to health and wellness. A big part of why I started Greatest was the sense that despite there being so much noise in the space, there really wasn't anything that was something you could trust and rely on on a regular basis. And that seems really messed up in a space that is only exponentially growing in, in importance, right? And that's so personal and private. And, and you know, so, so I think... I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of noise, so I don't know how much signal there is in health and wellness. Uh, that's changing now, which is, I mean, I think we're changing it a little, but it's not just us, of course. Um, I think people are kind of waking up to, you know, that there are some trusted brands and some that are not. And a lot of the traditional media brands that people have thought of as trusted, like, a, you know, like, say, a Dr. Oz or um, like a WebMD, people increasingly trust them less uh, because you know, they're a little bit more like Kim Kardashian than they are like trusted health advisors. So, so I, think, I think that's, I tend to think the more information, the better, as long as it's coming from a good place and not just trying to sell you like a product um, or a solution. You know, when I turn on a TV, TV shows growing up and opened up magazines and did Google searches, it definitely felt like everything was trying to sell me a miracle pill and sell me a shortcut and everything seemed like it was telling me what I should look like and how I should feel. Um, and everything that was trustworthy was boring, you know, boring or scientific and felt like no one had to actually suffer through this. And everything that was fun and, and you know, fun and easy to read seemed like it was, you know, full of mistruths. And so uh, I think there's a, a huge burgeoning shift uh, towards 
you know, more trusted health information, which I think is good. But I also think people tend not to care about this stuff. They tend to just trust their friends. They, trust to tr they tend to trust their communities. It, you know, everyone in the audience, if you think about the last like health tip that you adopted, my guess is that it didn't come from somebody on television or a magazine that you read and actually came from a friend of yours, um, you know, a partner, a like group of people. And, and that is, I think, Frankly, I think that's a huge part of the future of health and wellness. So would you say you're trying to build this type of trusted community with Greatest? And how are you using your users to, to use word of mouth to get, to get it out there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, so the topic is like the future of health and fitness. So I, I have a, a pet theory that I want to suggest. So, uh, I th so millennials increasingly turn away from religion and civic community. That's a fact. Right, um, the, the entire like generation is less likely to go to church, um, less likely to like you know show up at PTA meetings because they've in theory moved online, right? And they're like they've in, they've see they're seeking connection online, but I think what they found in many ways that it's led to more disconnection and there's a lack of sort of identity and association with a group of people like you, and. and I actually think health and fitness is the new excuse to find communities like you. And so uh, an example would be CrossFit, Zumba. Uh, how many people in this audience have done CrossFit, Zumba, or attended a Soul Cycle class? You know, some, some, some percent, right? Some, some maybe half. Uh, if I were to ask why, my guess is most of you would not respond because fitness burns calories. Um, you'd probably respond because my friends go there, because I love the way I feel, because it's just like, this is my, that's my special place or my special moment. A lot of the answers would have to do with people who are there. And so I think as we lose the connection to the like sort of traditional communities of the past, we're seeking new churches to worship at, you know, whether that's good or bad from a like, I don't know, societal perspective. I think at least if you're using health and fitness as an excuse, that seems positive. But w what, I, what I would suggest actually is that health and fitness might be the new sort of religion and people are using it, not in a negative way, but actually I think in an empowering way to find groups of people like them. And I think that those groups will only continue to get more and more fragmented. So to answer your question, which sounded like I wasn't at all, like this idea of like, I think greatest role is actually not to build one large massive community of people that are all trying to improve together. I hope that we can create that at some level, but the sort of harder difference making group is gonna be something that speaks to you personally. Maybe it's the November project, which is, you know, or Daybreaker, these things where people wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning and just dance and it's, supposedly sober way, um, or it's the November project where they're like, you know, participating in pretty like hardcore fitness things in the mornings, whether it's something in the evening where it's like, instead of going to like the club, you're going to like Soul Cycle in a spin class because your people are there and that group is there. Um, you know, instead of going to the gym and torturing yourself on a treadmill, you're going to a CrossFit class on Saturday that you wouldn't miss for anything in the world because your eight buddies who are going there too are expecting you to show up. So I think that's where, I think there'll be only more and more of that. And I think that's awesome because social groups is what helps people, you know, pushes them. It gives them this different level of sort of accountability, support, and pressure to participate in something that they all agree is relatively good for them. So, you know, CrossFit um, and SoulCycle and these, these new workout, I want to say trends, but, but lifestyle choices, um, using technology in their routines. Uh, what do you think is the future of the marriage between health and wellness using technology and your favorite, or what do you think is the best technology out there today for living a better and healthier lifestyle? Yeah. Uh, so, the three things you just mentioned actually don't use a lot of technology, which I think is fascinating. CrossFit tends to be actually the most, and, and SoulCycle, obviously there's like, you know, some stuff being tracked, but other classes that are frankly less popular than SoulCycle, like a, a flywheel or a swerve, uh, you know, there's a lot of them in New York City. Uh, they actually use it in like a competitive way, or you know, you can keep track of your numbers and add them in, Equinox will do this for you. CrossFit, there are some apps, but, but frankly, 
what we found, so Greatest now is five and a half years old, and for five and a half years, I've been asking the question, what will help people commit to health in a deeper way? It's one thing to read content. Today, we reach 10 million people every single month, we're one of the largest sites in the space. That's exciting. I mean, you know, we're really helping people accomplish what they want, helping them succeed at some goal, and in some crazy cases, people change their lives because of, like, reading our content. It's amazing. But it's ultimately very soft. We're reaching people on an extremely massive scale in a very soft way and asking, and it's kind of silly, but actually asking anybody in this audience to read two articles of anything is like an extremely huge commitment. So the question is how do we pe help people go deeper? And for quite some time I thought the answer was data. You know, get, get these trackers, and my guess is in the next three to five years, every single thing you're currently wearing, at least the fitness apparel, but most likely everything you're wearing will track your data unless you opt out of it, right? So assume every t-shirt, every, I mean, why isn't it in your shoes? And I frankly haven't quite figured that out yet. Like, doesn't that make sense? You're like literally taking steps. Why should it be on your wrist? But whatever. So like, you know, imagine it will be default. It will be so small, this technology, that it will be default built into everything you wear and you will get to choose whether that's tracked or not. But my guess is, is it'll be opt out. So opt you'll be like, or opt in, you'll be like functionally by default tracking everything. And my take on this after asking this audience for years is that no one really gives a shit. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that that isn't cool in theory, it's that in practice, what, what's the point of having how many steps you've walked, what your heart rate is like, unless there's some kind of context put around it, some kind of, you know, interesting tips and insights that are suggested to you, some kind of way to say, look, people like you who've succeeded in some way that you want to succeed did this differently. For like all of this to get to that, first of all, I don't think that's gonna happen in the next five years, maybe 10, but I'm not sure people will like push for that to happen. It's, it doesn't even quite make sense for us yet that you, know, that you would one day get like a prompt that says, you know, People like you who are trying to lose five pounds before their wedding in a healthy way take an extra, you know, street to the left on their way to work. Like, you know, it's hard to imagine that really making as much a difference as, I don't know, something like knowing your genetic code and making suggestions for what you should eat. So I tend to think fitness tracking is uh, heavily overrated. Um, I do think food tracking is extraordinarily hard, but I do think like, more personalized, I think genetic, knowing your genetic, what we're gonna be learning about like your genetics and how that applies to what you should be eating, it occurs to me will be really, really interesting and fa fascinating, excuse me, and uh, yeah, I just think uh, data tracking, I'm supposed to be like, ooh, whoa, technology and like fitness, and, but I think the honest answer is that for most people, these are extremely personal decisions, and I don't know, Anyone in this audience, I haven't seen a single person wearing a Fitbit, but I bet all of you wore one at one point or were gifted one at one point. And that's, that almost says enough in its own. These signals lessen over time. It is only interesting to you that relatively you walked more today than you did yesterday or more yesterday than you did today. That might push you to walk a little bit more but that dies out in terms of its relevance to you over time. That's not a difference maker in, in, in my, uh, the way I see it. Uh, and I don't think people care as much as like tech nerds care. We, I mean, we care a lot, but like, I don't think people care as much. So is there anything that worries you about the, how technology is progressing and, and informing our lifestyles in terms of making diet choices or eating choices or living choices? Well, I think a major concern for me, so, you know, we were joking about Pokemon Go earlier, and I heard it mentioned, uh, I'm a weird fan of, I mean, I'm not weird, I'm... What level? Unabashed 22. Uh, Let's give it up for Derek, level 22. Pokemon Go. The real person to be impressed by is not me, but my girlfriend, who has to put up with me being like, sorry, honey, can we slow down? Um, but, <laughs> but I actually, 
it's kind of given, restored a little faith in me about like how technology will play a role in fitness in the future. I think we can all assume that we will probably be living in some type of virtual reality in 10 to 15 years entirely, and at least attend school there, maybe run our careers through virtual reality. So the question is like, if we're sitting at home looking through, I mean, this is not very inspiring, but probably true. Like, so if you're sitting at home and looking through your device, you know, how are you gonna work out? You know, and how are you going to get moving? And so, frankly, my guess is actually, like, Pokemon Go has kind of changed my opinion on this because I'm impressed by how people are actively, people who weren't actively interested in, like, participating in life and, like, going to parks are going, you know? And, like, people are walking more steps because they want to hatch an egg. And this is, like... I mean, like, it's actually really fascinating. You can gamify it to some level, add some kind of social layer that like, allows you to play with friends and engage with others, that it drives action. That's cool. I, I think, and has given me a little bit more of an optimistic take on how, rea um, how technology sort of advance, uh, especially augmented reality, virtual reality, will play for us. And when you're shooting zombies, right, in like a game out in virtual reality, are you actually going to like be on, there's this book, I like really weird sci-fi fantasy shit, so sorry if this one's a little, there's this book that's pretty popular called uh, Ready Player One, which is, um, actually Steven Spielberg is making a film about it, it's about sort of a world in which people live in virtual reality, and people will buy treadmills, right, that go all kinds of different directions so that they can actually run and move in their virtual reality, okay, this is getting weird, never mind, um, but I mean, imagine, imagine if actually you get up in the morning and your workout is like the Tour de France, you know, like a stage in the Tour de France. It's like Peloton. Peloton is a good example of that today in like a very simplified way where you're sort of a part of a class going on an experience, but it's a bike you bought for just $15,000, you know. So, well, thank you so much. Um, we have a few minutes now for some Q&A if anyone from the crowd has a question. Yes, front row. In, in nutrition? Yes. So we, I talked about healthy recipes. We, we write a lot about nutrition. We think nutrition is more a... A lot of our content, so every piece, every single piece of content we write, every fact is cited by a scientific study from PubMed, and every article is approved by at least two experts. So every piece of content is expert approved and science backed. So there's not a single thing we write about that isn't truly legitimate. We just write about it in a way that's fun and friendly. So if you look up like anything on a nutrition topic, often in Google we pop up a lot, like you'll see us writing about it. But it's actually a lot less interesting to answer sort of what is Whole30 than it is to say like, here are some like Whole30 breakfast recipes. That gets people sort of taking action. And so uh, we tend to think of it a slightly more like that, but we do a lot, this is our number, is our number one most popular topic, is healthy recipes and, and nutrition. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Yes, right there. Yeah, so yeah, crazy, science. Uh, yeah, sorry, the, the, the question was like basically like how are we helping people who are joining in these communities, at least the way I understood the question, correct me if I'm wrong, is like how are we making sure that they're doing science-based things and not just making shit up? Taking action in general. Yeah, so I think it's actually just about the frame that you approach it as. I do think that... So one, I, I think brands and influencers make up an extra, have an extraordinary influence on this. Though I think you turn to your friends who's like, who are a little further along than you for their sort of advice. You take your information and inspiration a little bit, maybe slightly too much sometimes from your friends who seem to be figuring things out a little more. They're often getting their information from brands and influencers. I think in the past, brands and influencers have told you there's basically one action you should take and the action is buy our shit. Uh, and I think that that's, I think that's the problem. And so there's a new wave of brands and influencers that I believe are, are increasingly saying like, it's not about what you're doing, but why. 
you're doing it. At greatest is really not about being healthy. It's about having a healthy attitude. And so my answer to you is we're, we're, we'll encourage people less to take action X and more to take some action based on what they want to do. Um, I tend to think, look, I'm very blessed. I get to work every single day and I've worked now f for like five, going on five and a half years uh, at a company that I like you know, made up at some point, and then got to hire all these amazingly more talented, experienced people to like help me build it. And every day, all these people are helping me make good on the life mission, my life mission, like that is helping the world think of health in a healthier way, that it's not about what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And I think that healthy attitude is like the true difference. So when people are like, what is the one thing I should do for my health? I tend to be like, I have no clue, you know? Like, you should, the, my question is, why do you want to do anything for your health? And if your answer is, because you want to look really sexy at the beach, right? No judgment. Like, one, some people could judge that, but my judgment is like, look, if that's really what you want to do, then cool, man. Like, there's a lot of things you can do to look sexy at the beach. You know, if what you really want to do is keep up with your kids, or what you really want to do is you know, like push your partner to improve or what you really want to do is, you know, help make sure you live an extra 10 years in your life because that's important to you. All of those things, I think, tend to be such strong whys that then when you, you know, get off that treadmill for the 30th time and are like, fuck this, I hate treadmills, you'll, you won't just leave the gym and never come back. You'll actually be like, but maybe basketball is a solution or maybe volleyball is fun. And so anyway, I don't know. That was my very general answer to a very, I don't Time know if for I one more. at all. Yeah, it's the front row right here. Yeah. I actually tend to think that, um, I, I, did everyone hear, should I restate the question? I mean, the question was basically like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it, offline is easier in places like the West, basically the rest of the country, um, that's not a major, major city, because you get in a car and you drive to a gym, you know, less than 10% of this country goes to a gym, less than 10% has a membership at a gym, less than 1% of that actually goes regularly to the gym, so it's not like gym cultures, like, it's less of a thing than any of you might think, but yoga studios, so I think, I think the way I understood the question was like this, I was suggesting that we will live in our virtual reality like home universes and like never leave. I actually tend to think it will probably striate similarly. If you can actively access a group of people, you know, that are nearby, my guess is you will. I think that those communities will crop up both in a digital first environment but also offline. There's nothing quite that replaces like a in my experience, there's nothing quite that replicates the magic of like an in-person group. However, my crazy bet is that an increased relevance of the people that are within your group. So imagine online, you could say, these are 10 other people that are exactly your age, interested in exactly the same things, so who all of the exact same movies and want to accomplish the exact same goal in the same, exact same way and asynchronicity of being able to always communicate with them as opposed to having to be there at 7 p.m. at your Weight Watchers meeting or at 7 a.m. in the morning for your yoga class, that that will approximate it in some level. So I, I tend to think that both of these things will happen. Um, it just will depend on like your access points. Um, God, so many other things I want to talk about. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, basically I think, I actually think one of the biggest themes of the future will be disconnection and unplugging from technology and moving towards people. I think that, that will, there will be a huge push towards that um, because I think we are getting a little carried away and all staring at their, our, our phones and at least Pokemon Go Semi helps you like engage with the reality around you. Um, and then can I leave people with one other thought? Yes, one last thought. Okay, so... Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier the miracle pill. I've been thinking a lot about what if, I'm pretty convinced, I'm not a scientist, I don't pretend to be a scientist. I like am a translator after reading a fucking lot of PubMed studies. But I tend to believe it's unlike, it's likely that we will develop some kind of a drug, some kind of a pill that will be the miracle pill. That will actually like make it so we can eat whatever we want and lose weight. I, it's hard to imagine we won't discover that at some point. So my question to you, like the, the thought to leave on perhaps is, if that were to happen, would we be done? 
Would like things be good? Or would we just move our anxiety and stress about imperfection to something else? You know, will the topic 10 years from now that we'll be talking about not be called the future of health and fitness, but will just be called the future of like mental and psychological health? Like, will we be, will we be fine to other things that are, you know, not perfect? And I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about it. So thought that's fascinating. Thought it's a great to thought on. to end on. Um, well, thank you so it's much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I that. Thanks.